people have I, I support our sweet old guy. They're saying two negative tests and people are doing better. Well, we can't get it. We can't test. <laughs> this is just a vague recommendation right now. So two negative tests, well, actually four tests. Two from those, two from the mouth, taking them 24 hours. Clinical improvement. And this is a long thing from the suggested when someone threw out from IESA that I put likely to change because they even admit it's likely to change. It's basically if they do bad, if they do better, it gets negative testing. <coughs> oh, and this is some websites. This is a very interesting website. This is from John Hopkins. If you want to really see a pandemic unfold, go to this website. It's, it's fascinating. They update it all day long with real time information. You can click on the country, you can take your deaths, how many people recover, you can see crash, how many people doing better, what's the latest head. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And this is right before we had ours yesterday. We're going to adopt now. Um, other ones, CDC is very good. This is changing day to day. You can go there for information. And if anyone wants to sell, the WHO is very they're good. And they kind of give a general broad picture. The secretary basically almost every day gives a um, a speech about what he thinks is happening, and that's very good information. I don't know if we really have time to talk about that, you know, we may need to. What's that? We'll do that just in time. We're going to have to. Okay. So I'm going to step away, John. Who's up next? Um, 
And we are currently, we have PPE, but we're trying to conserve. That's our big thing right now, too. Um, conserving our PPE so when these patients do come in, we have everything available to protect everyone. Um, private physicians, I want to bring up, most of you probably have never been fit tested for an N95 mask. We do have plans in place to do just-in-time fit testing to make sure that we have the correct size mask for you at the time. Um, everything, the other thing I want to stress is everything needs to funnel, unfortunately, through myself or Dr. DePaula. Um, I know we talked about how the Office of Public Health, we called yesterday, we never called back. Ended up we didn't need them, but if we did need them direly, I do have a couple of uh, extra numbers, um, some of their private cell phones if we have to, to um, get what we need. So please funnel everything through the source of myself or Dr. Paula. When in doubt, call one of us. CDC test kits, but as of now, I think the count is only about 15 tests that have actually been deployed. Um, the case that we have currently right now is presumed. Um, they still are required a confirmatory test from CDC, and I'm not sure if that would happen today or tomorrow. Um, as far as testing is concerned, <clears throat> I think from the conference call that we had today, uh, early this morning, that um, it seems like LabCorp is going to be our regional provider for, for the uh, testing. Uh, as John said, uh, uh, Quest is not providing that in this area. I did reach out to um, uh, LabCorp this morning, the rep, and she did send me um, some guidance that uh, they're basically going to send everybody. So I'm going to ask Ray to see if he can send the, those PDF guides uh, to everybody's email, which I'll give a plug as well about emails. You've seen us also mention something on Everbridge um, recently. And um, if you are not receiving our emails, you really live, need to let the medical staff office know, especially now so that you're up to date. So uh, one thing to make sure that you're doing is checking your spam folders if you're not receiving communications from Dr. Uh, DeCordy, who's sending one practically about every day right now, if not multiple times a day. Yeah, every third day, there you go. So I'll, we'll send you out some information from that standpoint. Make sure that you're trying to stay uh, abreast of whatever communications that we send. As far as um, our clinical offices, you all are our front line. One of the things that we want to do is if you have a suspected case, make sure that you call either Dr. DeCordy or the ER and notify them prior to sending them so that we're a little more prepared. Uh, we do have a plan in place as far as how to, how to handle uh, PUIs, persons under investigation. Um, other than that, oh, one thing I want to stress, both labs have said this, do not send them to any uh, lab core site or quest site because they will not do the test there. They'll turn them away. Uh, probably not a good idea to send them there anyway. Uh, one other thing if you have, uh, I, I will bring up, is if you have medical students or residents that do round with you, uh, we ask that you not um, have them use PPEs um, so that we can make sure that we try to keep uh, a good stock of those as well. Keep them out of the room. Keep them out of the room, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So with that, I think uh, Ray and I will kind of tag team as far as any, any other things like that. Uh, at least to just bring up something that you already probably recognize as a conflict. Uh, the Department of Public Health, the Office of Public Health is recommending or demanding that you, these patients be sampled in a negative pressure environment. But they also realize they shouldn't be sent to these walking, ambulatory, relatively healthy patients that need to testing shouldn't be sent to the emergency department where they're going to really expose some of our very, our most vulnerable patients. 
And then that they're not going to be doing the swab testing at any diagnostic center. So uh, we unless, like I said, unless you have a negative pressure room in your office, uh, where are we supposed to do this? And that's why in some areas of the country you see drive-by testing done. In South Korea did it, and I have no doubt that some in uh, some form or matter we're going to be doing some type of online registration and drive-by testing to limit the amount of uh, PPEs that are needed to test large numbers of patients. Uh, in which uh, John said, we, we can't get the diagnostic test right now. The clearance tests, uh, we, you know, we, that's going to be down the line to, to tell whether or not the patients have convalesced adequately. We're only close to figuring that out. So this will be changing every three or four days. The uh, PPE issue, for example, is, uh, is, uh, is really becoming an issue because our par levels for our vendors of assigned to us are based on our annual TB exposure, which is very, very low. And they've cut those levels because of rationing for this as well. So we really have to get with our PPEs. Um, and, um, and what I'm also need some help is, what we can really be the biggest help is with advocating to our patients once at some point we start limiting access to various areas of the facility. There'll be some gripes, there'll be some complaints, please reinforce it's for not just on your best interest, but the healthcare team's best interest, so that we're here and we're not having to go on self-quarantine. At some point, I believe that the self-quarantine for healthcare workers is going to go away to the point where if you're exposed, you're going to wear a surgical mask, you're going to work through it. If you get sick, then you can channel for treatment zone. That's not out yet, but I have a few minutes. Actually, if I it chime is. in this morning, the CDC actually just said that they're not recommending and any uh, healthcare employees to be furloughed. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> until they have symptoms. <laughs> what is the oh. PPE? Personal protective equipment. The personal protective equipment, the, the face yeah, masks, gloves, gloves, face shield. Uh, uh, don't touch my patient. <laughs> 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 is there going to be suspected in your Is there going to be an area in the hospital set up for <laughs> testing? A separate that's area? what that's what he, uh, Dr. Deporti was just mentioning is that we're we're already in the consideration phase. We're just kind of, I think we're going to ramp this up based off surge levels. So the problem is right now is we don't have access to testing anyway, and and the testing that we have is about three to four days turnaround time. John so, John and I spent most of the first few hours of Sunday morning. I thought it was a lot earlier than it was, but I forgot to move my clocks. So <laughs> dealing with the Office of Public Health having a patient they literally wanted us to drive up the ramp, do a drive-by swab on the ramp, and let her go, which is now practice waiting to happen. And <laughs> our response was, where are you testing? Your Office of Public Health, this should be part of your Department of Health's mission is to have these clinics available, these testing centers available, in whatever format you needed to do. What are you spending the millions of dollars you going to do this for? That fell on deaf ears, and it was even more enlightening that they don't have enough staff to do it, and they don't even have adequate personal protective equipment. Around. So this, what what they're not capable of doing has just come to light in the last four or five days, and we're obviously going to be responding to this on the fly. If it's a relatively small number of patients, we'll do we'll do a low scale testing site. Uh, but if it becomes where we're having to screen thousands of patients, or hundreds of patients here in East Jefferson, thousands across the region, so we're going to have to have these drive through sites set up in some matter. Online registration, then drive by, get swab, go home, stay masked, and uh, wait for the test result. So, anybody is doing the testing in the city right now? Nobody? None of the no, hospitals? They're, they're at the area, but it's not, yeah, it's not effective. It's once they've been admitted. And the person that was being asked to drive up on the ramp was somebody we had reported to the Office of Public Health a week ago, Monday, as likely because she had come from South Korea nine days previously and had fever, had a cough, and was, had everything you can possibly imagine. What happened just now with the sneeze from Dr. Give the map. Another reason that meetings going forward of us will be on a, on a call system. So we're going to try to do a call, conference call. Uh, we commandeered this early, but going forward, we start having exposures in the community. I think it's time that we say, say hello to each other. Uh, 
on the call. So, quick, quick question. Any other questions? If a person has a URI-like symptom, no exposure to anybody from corona, and they are afibrile, so you don't worry about... If you're, so the recommendation... If there's no fever. If, again, if they have symptoms similar to that, I would suggest in your clinic setting, because we really don't know if they have it or yeah. not, that they're shedding or haven't had full-blown symptoms, that you have them wear a mask. Uh, the other thing I've done in my personal practice, and I'll give this as an anecdotal recommendation, is that you start to communicate with your patient base. If, if they have any respiratory symptoms similar to the ones that are described here, that they try to call in first ahead of time so that we can triage them that way and maybe try to manage them at home for the time being. Unless their symptoms get worse, where at that point then we would notify the ER that we have somebody that's coming in so that we can isolate that patient as well. Um, the reality is that the, the conflicting or difficult part of this is the travel question is really not going to be an effective question to have anymore within a couple of days. And we've been saying this since last week that this was going to be a rapid situation. So we're also dealing with flu right now. It's still pretty, pretty prevalent. There are some differences between the two, but we can test for flu, and if they're positive for it, then they're not, not likely going to have uh, coronavirus at the same time. So to answer your question, if you do happen to have a patient in your office that has cold-like symptoms or upper respiratory tract uh, symptoms, then I would have them masked up and try to keep them isolated in an area. He brings a good, good point. I forgot to mention, they do recommend us getting a flu test. Okay. Yeah, they do recommend us getting a flu test. Now keep in mind, if the flu test is not a PCR, it is, it's probably about 80% sensitive, but as a PCR test, you're looking at more like 99%. So if someone does have symptoms, get the flu test on them, especially if they get admitted or thinking about it. Yeah, I, I was. My office was notified earlier today in Quest Labs that if somebody comes in sick, cough, cold, they can turn them away. They can have them go back to the referring doctor to return with the surgical mask before they touch them, take any blood, anything like that. So I don't know if anybody else has seen that. But well, we've seen a few things. A couple of them are a little distressing. For example, that's Quest with a point of care. However, there's dialysis centers that said that patient, they're going to screen people that should be patients under investigation. And if they are, and they're scheduled for their dialysis, they're going to try to send them to a local community hospital. I would strongly recommend our nephrologists not do that because we're not going to treat patients who do not need treatment in our emergency department for various reasons, not the least of which is exposure, and also for even more least than that, the fact we're not going to get paid for it. Great. I have a two question. One is, what did you early test? If you have respiratory symptoms, I have a case yesterday talking about a patient came from Germany 10 days ago, has a first-hand cough that hurt beautiful cough, horrible. It's variable. It's variable. It's Usually, very. you know, maybe around day six or seven, yeah. much also anything else different about about a so week or so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, there's not, there's really not much. Unfortunately, it's it's more than just a call. I would say, you know, if they have more short but more pneumonia-like symptoms, if you do you get evaluated, but once again, there's not a good way to differentiate that from just a regular viral pneumonia. So now, with the calculator not being necessarily the issue, I mean, in the worst case scenario, you have a kid in school who has positive. What are we going to tell the parents for the rest of the kids? Because you're in that six foot window of those kids that test positive. That test positive. Well, that's, that's a good question to offer public health. <laughs> but I mean, they may want to they may want to send the other kids home in self isolation. That's one of the things we got to think about. Yeah. But in reality, in that case, it's likely going to be the teachers and the adults that are going to be positive and not the kids. I think what's the prevalence of pediatric age? I mean, very low. Yeah, and they do very well. Yeah. Kids actually, this is one thing they got going for them. They actually, all age kids, maybe so they tend to do very, very, very well. It's not like the flu. It's kind of like this. This is just low age. Mortality goes up as you get older. So are there worst case scenario contingency plans for surging of ICU beds, staffing, kind yes. of some horror stories out of Italy out of, you know, <coughs> ICU beds? We have all kinds of plans, but like a lot of people, first time when you get punched in the mouth and say, 
Uh, that's what it's coming down to. Are we going to? How many? If you get a surge, need that kind of a surge? How many of your nurses are going to be taken offline? I mean, it's so it's going to be it's going to be as stressful as that. Can you imagine any type of situation and people who are you know that have been exposed and are well can treat the patients who are sick? You know, if you that becomes that scenario. True. I guess I'm not thinking if you ever had COVID-19, they said you could maybe treat them. We did um, convert ICU-3 to completely airborne unit. So it's completely airborne. Now you have to walk, even to walk in the unit, you have to be gowned up to work on the computers. You have to be gowned up. But that's ICU-3 has already been converted and ready to go. We, we, we took that from our Ebola plan back in uh, 2014. Can you use N95 masks again, or is it one time use only? So two, two points to that. Again, we leaving it on all day. Do not take it off. If you take it off, you should not use it again. The second part, which is real important, is how you take it off. And that'll be the doffing and donning, donning and doffing. Make sure you take it off from the back. Don't touch the front part of the mask. Do not put your name on it with a marker, because that will actually make the mask defective as well. Yeah, when the outside's considered contaminated. So you're trying to, you could leave it on. Odds, oddly enough, for, t for TB patients, you can't take it on off because it's not really considered. You don't get TB from phone lines. But um, yeah, you could leave it on for like eight hours at a time. So we may cohort patients. One nurse or one doctor just gales up, goes one down, you know, sees all the patients and comes back. Just to clarify with that, you're leaving it on for eight hours, you will have to leave it on and not. Adjust. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you yeah. Right nose, yeah. you right. don't eat. I mean, it could be done. That's why the done. contingency plan it will probably it's really fall more like Ebola, where we're going to be cycling people in a, in a period of time. Do, do we have a plan for reducing hospital visitors primarily because of lack yes, of PPE? Yes, that's what I'm working on. 